it's always good to be in the Lord's house on Wednesday night. Genesis chapter number 12. And uh, we've been preaching uh, on some biographical messages on the life of Peter. And I'd like to do a biographical message tonight on the life, uh, or at least a facet of the life of Abraham. Genesis chapter number 12. Now, one of the things I taught our uh, eschatology class down at Jacksonville is that the basis of all the prophecy in the New Testament is hinged upon four main covenants in the Old Testament. That seems strange to some people to think that the New Testament prophecies are based, find their foundation in four major covenants in the Old Testament. And uh, it starts with the Abrahamic covenant where God gave Abraham a promise. He made several promises to Abraham. And Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for what? Righteousness. He believed and that was counted for righteousness. Same way everybody gets saved, just by believing. And then, uh, then there's, uh, there's the, uh, the Davidic covenant, which expanded the Abrahamic covenant. And uh, there were other covenants, the new covenant, and it promised more uh, blessing to the to the house of Israel, and as you and I are part of the church, we get, to, we get in on it. Even though we're not part of the Old Testament crowd of saints, we still get some of the expanded blessings of, that come from the New Covenant, although it was made primarily to Israel, uh, contrary to what some believe, uh, and, uh, and so we're in on it. But here we're going to find the foundation of all the covenants in Abraham. And so Abraham, chapter number 12, we'll read in verse number 1. Everybody wide awake tonight? Happy? All right, I hope so. <laughs> Chapter 12, verse number 1. Now the Lord, had said unto, the Lord had said unto Abram, when did he say it? Well, if you go to Acts chapter 7 and, Luke, and read the testimony of Stephen, he says, and giving his account of Abraham, that this was said to Abraham, Abram in those days, it was said to him, God first appeared to Abram, in Ur of the, Chalde of the Chaldees. And he said, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Hey, that's not part of the message tonight, but can I just tell you that everybody ought to want to be a blessing to somebody else? God singled Abraham out and said, I want you and your posterity to be a blessing to people. When I lie in that casket like Billy Brooks did on Monday, if nobody can say anything else about me, I hope they can at least say, well, he was a blessing at times <laughs> when he closed the sermon out real quickly. Didn't happen much, but he did it once in a while. <laughs> and uh, we ought to always want to be a blessing to people. Be a blessing. Every day we ought to look to be a blessing. And he said uh, in verse Number three, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And certainly the Israelites have blessed people all over the world through the fact that we get our Bible through the nation of Israel, the Jew. If it wasn't for the Jews, we wouldn't have a Bible. And Luke's the only Gentile writer in there. The rest of them are all Jews. And... Uh, and through their inventions, and uh, they've invented a lot through their medical and scientific discoveries, Israel has been a blessing to the whole world. And so in verse 4 it says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. See, you can be 75 years old and just be getting started, right? <laughs> yeah, I feel better already. And so Abram just getting started, age 75. God wasn't even started, much less done with him yet. And verse number 5 says, And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And uh, they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land under the place of Sichem, under the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thy seed, Will I give this land? So there's the promise of the land, right? Talking about a covenant. God made with Abraham 
and his kids would all be Israel, and Israel owns that land. I don't care what the Palestinians say. I don't care what the Muslims say. I don't care what the Arabs say or any of the other nuts over there. This land was given by God to Abraham and his seed. And Abraham, the verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he builded an altar. Underline the word altar. Unto the Lord who appeared unto him. We all need to have an altar. Now we don't uh, sacrifice animals on it, shed blood on it like they did in the Old Testament, but we need to have a place of sacrifice, a place where we connect with God. Verse 8, And he removed from thence unto a mountain, on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east and there he builded an altar unto the Lord he called upon the name of the Lord and Abram journeyed going on still toward the south well at least he's going the right direction everybody ought to go south right I just go to show you God's not in favor of going to Yankee land don't ever move north <laughs> just don't go all the way to Texas <laughs> Verse 9, And Abram journeyed going still toward the south, and there was a famine in the land. Oh, look out, Abram. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. That, that means she was beautiful. She was up in the years at this point that she was beautiful beautiful. you got to understand that back in those days, the gene pool had not been affected by our, the sin that's carried on up into our day now. And so people lived longer and uh, they kept their looks of youth uh, a lot later in life. I think my wife tapped into that gene pool, but somehow I missed it. <laughs> I missed it, I guess. <laughs> and don't amen that. <laughs> And verse 11, and it says, And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Now his imagination gets running away with him a little bit there. And uh, he's thinking, Look out for number one. <laughs> Even if you have to lie. Verse 13, Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake. He's saying, look, you, you had not got much going for you. You need me. <laughs> you got to keep me, keep me alive so I can take care of you. <laughs> you kept being a little bit of a jerk there. And my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass, verse 14, that when Abram was come into Egypt, the, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair the princess the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, before Pharaoh and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house and he entreated Abram well for her sake and he had sheep and oxen and, and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels and the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai Abram's wife and Pharaoh called Abram and said what is this thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister? I might have taken her to, to me to wife, and now therefore behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men con concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Father, I pray that you'd bless us tonight. Help us to discover truths that would be beneficial in our own lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we're going to talk about the first steps of finding the purpose of God. The first steps in finding the purpose of God. When I was a boy, I remember, or a young man, I don't remember exactly when, but I saw a little contraption once. It was, had a little crank on it. It had some gears and levers and uh, pulleys and, and uh, moving parts, and you could turn that crank, and all those little parts would move. It didn't do anything. Oh, and we, we've tapped into the local radio station, I guess. <laughs> and so you turn this little crank, and all those parts would move, 
but, but it didn't do anything. I mean, it had no use. And on the underside of it, it had stamped the title of the machine was the do-nothing machine. <laughs> and it had all the moving parts, but it did nothing of any benefit. And, you know, I fear that that's the way it is with a lot of God's people. Uh, we live life and don't ever find out what God's purpose is for our life. I've got a purpose. You have a purpose. Everybody that's saved, God gave a purpose. He's got something for you. And, uh, and so these scriptures, I think, will help us to find these first steps in finding out God's purpose for our life. Abraham was certainly a pioneer in this, in this area. And pioneers are always a breed apart because uh, they journey, as did Abraham. And uh, they journey into unknown territory and experience the, the adventures of finding God's purpose for their life. Abraham's prominence in the Bible is evidenced by the amount of space devoted to him. There's a lot of space in the Bible devoted to Abraham. Do you ever notice when you're reading through there how much is talked about Abraham, both in the Old Testament, even when you get in the New Testament? The Bible talks about Abraham. I think God was interested in Abraham, don't you? The Bible calls Abraham God's friend. He was a friend to God. And so if God made that statement about Abraham, I think he was important to God. And, uh, and so I think we would do well to see his example. He's called the friend of God in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, Isaiah 41, 8, and James 2, 23. Three times the, the Bible, uh, the New Testament, traces the genealogy of Christ to its spiritual beginning. There in Matthew 1, 1, talks about it. And in the Bible, Moses is a great lawgiver. David is a, the greatest king. And Elijah, many acknowledge Elijah to be the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. Now, you might not be able to be uh, a Moses as a lawgiver. And you might, not be, uh, you might not be King David sitting on the throne and be hailed as the greatest king of Israel. And you might not ever be an Elijah who calls fire down from heaven and kills 400 prophets of Baal but you can still have a purpose and God wants you to know that purpose and we can be his friend and it takes four initial steps to find out what it is. Number one, motivate when you hear God's voice. Motivate, get activated, do something. When we hear God's voice, he's not, as my dad used to say, I'm not just talking to hear me. <laughs> when he'd tell me something, he'd say, I'm not talking just to hear myself talk. I'm talking so you can hear me. And I think when God speaks, he expects some action. He wants us to motivate. When Abraham heard the voice of God, he got up and did something about it. And too many times, I think today, in today's churches, I think churches are filled. Not this church, thank goodness. I think we've got some good folks who want to hear the word of the Lord. But I think a lot of churches are filled with people who go there because it's their religious duty. And they hadn't got a clue what the preacher said. And maybe a lot of them, the preacher didn't say anything worth hearing anyway. But the truth is, God has got a purpose for everybody. And he means for that purpose to be conveyed. And when somebody learns the purpose of God, God means for them to get up and do something with what they heard. And so the word of God is meant to activate us, to motivate us. And Abram did exactly that. Abram was born around 2160 B.C., and uh, is known as Abram until God changed his name when he established the covenant of circumcision in Genesis chapter uh, 17. Abraham grows up in Ur. That's way over on the east side of Israel, uh, way over yonder, like 700, 700 maybe eight, 900 miles away. And he grows up over there, and he's got two brothers, Nahor and Haran, who becomes, Haran becomes the father of Lot, and after Haran dies, Abram, his wife Sarai, and his father Terah, and his, his nephew Lot leave Ur, and they settle down in Haran. And uh, that's where Terah dies. And then God's call initially comes to Abram, though while living in Ur. It says in Genesis 12, 1, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land I will show thee. God also says he'll make him a great nation and make his name great in verse number 2. And uh, God has three very important purposes on his call to Abram. First, he, he has a land that he's promising to Abram. You saw that, right? When we read it, read it, he wants to give Abram and his descendants a land. And second, he wants to make of him a great nation. And third, he says he'll make... Uh, his name great and these are all uh, 
promises, amazing promises that God made to Abram. So did Abram have a purpose in life? Did God have a purpose for him? You bet. He had three big purposes he wanted him to fulfill. And uh, God tells him to get out of there and go, and I'll show you a land when you get there. I'll let you know. He said, I want you to load up and head out and just go and uh, get moving. See, this, this is what we're saying in this first point. Knowing the will of God, knowing the purpose of God, means that when we hear the voice of God, we get moving. God uses people who are in motion. I said this to somebody. might have been somebody sitting here now a few days ago. I said, how are you doing? Somebody said, Ben, I am tired. I said, I am too. But you know the old saying, God, uh, God says uh, somewhere or another to somebody that, that tired men rule the world. You know why that is? They used to tell us that in Bible college because we were all tired. I think they were just trying to keep us motivated because <laughs> we were going without sleep and working hard and going to school full time. And uh, every time we'd go to sleep in class or something, they'd wake us up and say, hey, stand up, get woke up. I'm tired. Well, we just remember the world is ruled by tired men. <laughs> I guess that was going to give us some hope that everything would be okay. Uh, that, and we'd... Uh, We'd belly ache and complain about being uh, working such a long schedule, you know. And, and uh, the instructors at Bible college would say, "Man, if you think it's tough now, just wait till you get out." <laughs> now I don't think I don't think it ever was as tough after we got out as it was at Bible college. I think they were just kind of make us feel good about that. But knowing God's purpose is of paramount, paramount importance. That we know God's purpose. If I'm going to if I am going to complete my life for what God wanted me to do, I need to know what he expects out of me. I need to know where he wants me to go. And I've got to get up and get moving at least. <laughs> you know, knowing the will of God is kind of like, uh, it's kind of like steering a car. You, can't, you ever notice how hard it is turning the steering wheel on a car when it's sitting still? But once it's rolling, you turn the steering wheel and it turns a lot easier when it's rolling. That's the way we are. When we're stuck in one place and God's trying to show us where he wants us to go, man, it's hard, it's hard for us to get up and get moving in the right direction that God wants us to go because we're sitting still. But if we get busy doing something for God, then when he speaks, we're already in motion and then we can, we can be steered by God in the right direction. Are you listening to me? Uh, talking about the, uh, the direction, the purpose that God has for us once we get busy, then God can use us. God's looking for people that already have something going on. You know what? He's not looking for somebody's laying in the bed. He's not looking for somebody's laying in the hammock taking a nap. He's not looking for somebody who's stuck in the recliner. God's looking for somebody who's already moving and doing something. I, I like what Jack Howe said one time in the, one of his messages were recorded I listened to when I was a young man. He said, Somebody was criticizing Jack Hiles for the way he did ministry. He said, well, we, don't, we don't agree with the way you do that. He said, well, I like the way I do it wrong better than the way you don't do it at all. <laughs> and that's kind, of, that's kind of the solution, I think. If, even if we're doing something not precisely perfect, I think God appreciates it when we are moving. And then he can steer us in the right direction. To find God's purpose, we must be moving actively serving the Lord in other words we need to be at least be in church regularly going to Bible studies regularly reading our Bible and praying and doing those basic things and giving and supporting missions Hey, you don't have to know what God's specific will is if you just do the general things that you already know and if we're moving in that direction then God can take somebody that's moving and say this is where I want you to go when I was a boy, a little boy, I'd go down to my grandma and grandpa's house. Grandma always had that tall, I don't know if they got it now or not, the tall bottle of Alka-Seltzers. Do they still make those? There's a long glass tube of Alka-Seltzer. They came in a, it was a tall bottle. Does anybody remember them? Uh, am I that old? <laughs> but Granny had the, a real tall bottle of Alka-Seltzers. And us kids would get in there and get into Granny's Alka Seltzers. We we get some of those tablets out and drop them in a glass of water. You know what they do when they hit water, right? Those tablets are just laying in their bottle, not doing anything. They're just they're just sitting there. But boy, you drop them in a glass of water and they start bubbling and fizzing. 
and we played like we were making soda pop, and we were drinking uh, over-the-counter drugs for pop <laughs> instead. But we loved to get in those Alka-Seltzer, and she'd catch us in them, and she'd go run us out of the kitchen and make us go outside. <laughs> but I, I think that's what God likes to see out of, uh, out of Christians. He likes to see them bubbling and moving and doing something, and once they're moving, it's a lot easier to get them to do the right thing. Uh, you, like Abraham, you don't need everything revealed at the very start. You may not know. God may be uh, leading you to do a certain thing, and you're thinking about it in your mind, and, and uh, it's touching your heart, and you're praying maybe a little bit about it, but you, you're confused, or, or maybe you're held back because you don't see how this could turn out for the good, and you're looking at that and thinking, well, I don't even want to think about it. Well, you don't have to know everything about the end of the result if we just get up and get to moving God will God will figure out how to tell us at the right time one step at a time the the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord one step at a time you may not know where God wants you in the end Abraham didn't what did God tell Abraham get thee into a land that I will show thee he didn't know where he was going he just said, take off and get moving. I'll show you where you're going when you get there. <laughs> yeah, sound like, sound like that would be exciting for some of you. Uh, not for most women. They'd like to know what's going on. <laughs> but uh, he, he was ready to get moving, load up his family, and they headed out one step at a time. If you believe God wants you to do something, you just take, take the next step, and then he'll reveal to you. I had to go work with my bees today. I was telling Brother Jimmy, uh, since I had my stroke, I've not felt strong enough like I could carry the equipment. Or, And, you know, when you're inspecting bees and you pull those frames out and they're all covered with honeybees, you don't want to be shaking the thing around and dropping it, <laughs> right? You don't want to drop a, a, a box of bees or a frame of bees. And you want your hands to be steady because that's how you inspect bees without making them mad is when you're steady. Well, my left hand wasn't very steady. But this week, see, going into uh, the last half of April, into May is the big honey flow. We call it a honey flow. It's a nectar flow. But that's where the most blossoms are at this time of year. I mean, has anybody seen the privet hedges blooming? You have allergies, hate them, but the bees love them. And, uh, and all the clover is starting to bloom, and there's just blossoms. Blackberries are blooming. Everything's just blooming all over right now. And so throughout the month of May, that's the big honey crop. And if you miss that, you've pretty well missed everything unless you carry your bees down to a soybean field in August. And so I didn't want to miss out on, on the honey for all my bees this year, so I figured I've got to do this. And uh, Karen went with me. I had to go down to McRae. I've got some bees down there. And so she went with me. She was afraid for me to go off by myself. And so she went with me down there and sat in the truck. She didn't want to get out for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> but I tended to those bees. And, and then, uh, and then I had some more at another yard. I went and checked on. Had uh, several hives. I had to carry the carry a box in each hand, and get out there, and then open up the hives, and then move some of the frames up into the new boxes. And I had to do that. And I had to walk through the brush to get to some of them. And there's little stumps about this high and about big around as your finger, a little bigger where bushes have been chopped off by a bush hog, and they're just everywhere. And you, it's easy to trip over those. And my left foot. I think I'm picking it up most of the time. I think I'm picking it up, but evidently I'm not. And I trip over stuff. And so I thought, man, I don't know if I can get out there. I've got to walk about 200 yards to get out there to this bee yard through the brush. Will I be able to do it? Man, I can't tell you how big a job that was in my mind. It never was before, but this year it was a big job. I'm wondering, am I going to be able to do this? And I told myself, I've got to do it. So all I'm going to do is pick up those hives and just, and I have to make about five trips out to the bee yard. I'm just going to take one step at a time. I'm going to take one step, and if I can get that one step made, I'll watch, make sure there's no stumps in the way, and I'll take another step. And I'll do that until I get the job done. I got it done. <laughs> Seemed like an eternity, but I got it done. And you know what? Doing the will of God is kind of like that. We just got to take one step at a time. If we think about making the whole journey, it sounds like a big job. It seems like a, a treacherous thing to have to do. If God's called somebody to preach, they think, man, 
I don't know if I can do this or not. You don't have to figure out if God's called you to pastor or to be a missionary or to, or to be an evangelist. Just surrender to public, surrender to preach, and that'll get you started one step in the right direction. Amen? Just take it one step. And uh, when God calls you to do anything, just don't back up, don't halt, don't think, man, I don't know how I can ever get to the other end of this job. I don't know how I'll get it done. Just remember, God wants you to take one step at a time. He told Abram, just leave out and head out, and I'll tell you when you get there, okay? Take the next step. Launch out into the deep and just go. So the first step in knowing the purpose of God is to motivate, get activated or actuated, and then that's when you hear God's voice, get up and start moving. The second thing about finding God's purpose is to communicate. Communicate. Notice verse number 6 in our text again. Remember, Abram heard the voice of God. and What did he do? He got up and started moving. God said, I'll let you know when you're at the right place. Verse 6, And Abraham passed through the land under the place of Sikkim and the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was, in the, was then in the land. The Canaanites were wicked. They didn't do a lot of the right type of worshiping, you know. And uh, verse number 7, it says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, unto thy seed will I give this land and there he builded an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him and then he moved from thence unto a mountain on the east side of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east and there he built an altar unto the Lord and he what's the next word called he called upon the name of the Lord he called what is that that's communication if we want to know the purpose God has for our life we hear the voice of God, then we motivate, activate, actuate, get moving as soon as we hear the voice of God, and then we communicate. We're going to be talking to God. We need an altar. To know the purpose of God, we need to have an altar, a place where we can get alone, away from the sounds of the world, and get alone with God, and just a place where we can hear His, where we can hear His voice. You know, the world is so busy. I'm not talking about just horns honking and traffic on the road. I'm talking about it seems like people can't live without having a noise going on all the time. It seems like people have got a smartphone or they've got a computer or they've got a television or a radio or music booming or something going on. We've got to have something booming in our ears all the time. You know what I think? I think we need to do just what Abraham did. He got off to a place over here and built an altar where he could get still and quiet and hear the voice of God. Our world is just way too busy. Now, we may have to be busy when we work, but there ought to be a time when we can get that job done, maybe our daily work done, get our daily chores done, our daily studies done, and find that quiet place where we can hear the voice of God and talk to God and communicate. If we're going to find God's purpose, we need to communicate we need to stay in touch with God. What did Abram do? He built, an off, he built an altar. An altar suggests that sacrifice. Right? In the Old Testament, they would sacrifice animals on the altar. We're not under the law. So we don't sacrifice altars. But what does it say over in Romans chapter number 12? Present yourself a living sacrifice. You know what? God doesn't want you to commit suicide. He doesn't want you to kill one of your children and put them on the altar. He doesn't want you to kill one of your sheep or your goats or a dog and put on the altar. What God wants, God wants me to get on the altar. Alive. A lot of people say, well, I would die for Jesus. Well, I have my doubts about that in the first place. But in the second place, I don't think God wants anybody to be a dead sacrifice. According to, to the, tec the text in... Uh, in Romans chapter 12, he wants a living sacrifice. He didn't want you to die for Jesus. He wants you to live for Jesus. And, and uh, way too many Christians today are not living for him. And so he had a place where he could call on the Lord and some, a place where he spent some time. Uh, after praying, Abraham then continues on down towards the south into the dry country in southern Canaan. When I was in Israel a few years ago, I thought I was impressed with the desolation of the south part of Israel. When you get down there around Hebron 
and further south, it's just old sand hills and craggy rocks. And you don't see any trees or anything. It's just desolate, dry, barren, desert land. That's where Abram ended up. Before God can use us to a great degree, before God can uh, let us know his purpose to a T, I think there's times when we may have spent some time in a desert. Abraham did. You remember what happened to Jesus as soon as he was baptized, before he began his public ministry in a big way, you know where he was led by the Spirit? Out into the desert. The Apostle Paul, in Galatians 1.15, we see Paul getting his basic knowledge directly from God out in the Arabian desert. Galatians 1.15 says, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me that I might preach Him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. Before Paul became the great apostle to the Gentiles, you know what he did? He spent some time out in the desert. Jesus spent time in the desert. Abram spent time in the desert. And I think you and I, if we're going to do the will of God and know the purposes of God, many times God will lead us through some desert areas of life. We may not choose to be there. We may not like it there. But it's a beneficial place, apparently, to be when God wills it in our life. That was a place where God communicated with Paul in the desert, being in a desert place. And it's those barren places when something, we may even feel like our life is not in tune with God at the time we're in a desert place, but it might be that God's got us there for the quietness so he can speak and we'll hear. You may be in a place where, you, where you'd rather not be, but that's a good time to listen for the voice of God. God speaks in such places as the desert. So the first initial step to find God's purpose in our life is to motivate. Second is to communicate. And then thirdly, to anticipate problems. Anticipate. In verse number 10 in our text, it says, And there was a famine in the land. That sounds like a problem, doesn't it? famine in the land a famine in the land Abram's probably thinking wow if I'm in God's will and if this is God's purpose why is he letting me go hungry why, why are the crops failing why is there not any rain maybe, maybe instead of looking at this old desert place maybe I need to go down and look at the fertile banks of the Nile River and going down to Egypt and so he, in his mind he figured out how to solve the problem but that wasn't God's solution Egypt being a picture of the world, uh, I believe he went in the wrong direction. So what do we get from this? Very quickly, uh, anticipate. If you're going to know the purpose of God, don't be fooled into thinking that everything's going to be hunky-dory. You can be in the will of God and things can be bombarding you. You can be in the will of God and be hungry. You can be in the will of God and be broke. You can be in the will of God and be lonely. You can be in the will of God and not feel like everything's going your way. But it may be where God wants you. But if we anticipate the problems, we won't be disappointed. God can still use people who have problems. Noah had a problem. He got drunk. Samson had a problem. He had a weakness for women. David had a problem, adultery and murder. Even the greatest Old Testament prophets like Elijah. Elijah was a man who did the will of God and preached the word of God fearlessly. But there was a time when Elijah ran after he killed those 400 prophets of Baal. He ran from Jezebel to the south end of the country, crawled under a juniper tree and said, God, why don't you just go ahead and kill me? I don't feel like serving you anymore. And besides, I'm the only one left. You might as well go ahead and get rid of me too. 
Well, Elijah battled depression. And there's times when you and I might battle depression or feelings of worthlessness. And uh, we just got to go on through those times. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher of London, in the 1800s it is said that in his own journals, he said that sometimes, he said sometimes I battle depression until it just almost completely overcomes me. He said there's times when I go to the pulpit so depressed that I don't want to preach and I feel like anybody would be more fit to stand in the pulpit but me. But he said it's, my, it's what I'm supposed to do. And he said it might be that even suffering from this malady like I suffer, a feeling this way, maybe God's got me here so that I know how some of you feel and what you need to hear. And through his own depression, Charles Spurgeon was able to, to encourage thousands of others, other people. You see, you may go through things in your own life that seems a discouragement to you, but it might be something that you can pass on to somebody else. Abram is a human, and he's facing starvation, and he goes down to Egypt. Should he have gone? I don't think so. But that just shows that he was a human being. And so whatever you are tempted to do, don't feel like you're the first one it ever happened to. Abram had the same problem. He was tempted as well. Knowing that his wife, Sarah, is beautiful, even at age 65, he decides to have her to tell a lie and tell the men of the land, well, she's just my sister. And so Pharaoh, the servants of Pharaoh see her, and sure enough, she is beautiful. And so they speak well of her in the ears of Pharaoh. And he says, well, put her on the agenda to become one of my wives. Sorry, Abram. He should have been whipped with a dead skunk. But that's what he did. <laughs> he let his wife lie for him. And then Pharaoh, somehow there's this plague from God that falls on the Egyptians. And Pharaoh figures out somehow that Abram's lied to him. That really is his wife. And now this pagan, this pagan, he's even more, he's talking more spiritual than Abram himself now and rebukes him for it. I mean, Abram is about to commit matrimonial suicide. <laughs> he's about to lose his wife. I mean, you don't want to be like, uh, like Abram or, or like the, the bank robbery I heard about. I heard about this bank robbery where guy went in with a ski mask and y'all that work at the bank will think this is cute <laughs> this guy went in with a ski mask and at gunpoint robbed the the bank and had a big sack of money and as he's walking by some of the people on his way out one brave soul reached out and ripped his mask off so his face was exposed bank robber turned around and just shot him right on the spot he looked at the teller who was looking at him also and he shot him so he put his mask back on he said all right did anybody else see my face the old farmer said, I think my wife got a pretty good look at you. <laughs> Don't want to do that, right? <laughs> and so Abram's doing something about that dumb. And, uh, but he's, he's too busy counting his camels and his donkeys and all the stuff he's getting. So he's being treated really well by Pharaoh because Pharaoh likes him because he thinks he's going to get to marry his sister, who's really his wife. And so Abram's busy gathering up all of his goods He's not even thinking about his wife. And so his deceit seems to be paying off, but that's about to change, and that brings us to the last point. Number four, capitulate to God's discipline. Capitulate or give in to God's discipline. Verse 17, And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house because of the plagues, because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidst thou she is my sister? I might have taken her to be my wife. Now therefore behold thy wife. Take her and go thy way. You know I think. I don't know if we can put the inflection in the word of God. That really ought to be there. I don't know how it, God meant that when he wrote it. But he might have said here take her. <laughs> and shoved her into Abram's hands. Said take your wife and get out of here. And uh, he was sick and tired of being fooled by Abram at this point. And we could, we could say, well, sorry, Abram. 
sorry rascal but then we don't want to get too harsh on him but but by the but for the grace of God there go I right see any sin that these that these heroes of the faith any sin that they committed you and I have the capability to commit any of those sins we don't need to say man I would never do that <laughs> I hope I wouldn't do that I hope I wouldn't but I'm not going to be brave enough to say I definitely wouldn't do that I can only say I think I wouldn't or I hope I wouldn't because the same temptations that befell Abram can befall you and me 1 Corinthians 10 12 says wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall when the servant of the Lord is trying to fulfill his purpose he may find himself in the clutches of a big mess like Abram did but the remedy for sin is still the same confess and repent get things right and then get up if you've messed up get up to find the purpose of God you have to be able to get up after you've confessed and repented brush the dust of the sin off of yourself and then keep on going don't turn back I don't know how many people that I've talked to in the past over the years decades who have messed up somewhere along the line never to serve God again Hey, but they say well I don't want to be a hypocrite well if you refuse to serve the God who died for you on the cross you're being a hypocrite trampling underfoot the blood of Christ is being a hypocrite I would rather I don't want to sin but if I do sin I'm going to confess it forsake it and get up dust off and try to serve him again just keep on going and don't give up don't quit we're all going to mess up but we don't have to quit a just man falleth seven times, yet he riseth up again. Just because you've messed up doesn't mean you have to quit. Confess it and go on. The initial steps for finding God's purpose is to motivate when you hear God's voice. Communicate with God. Anticipate that you're going to have problems. And capitulate when you mess up. Capitulate to God's discipline. So here's my concluding question. Which of these steps to finding the purpose of God have been the hardest in your life? And what can you do to get it right? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd bless us. Help us to find your purpose for us. Lord, help us to understand that we're not going to have a perfect way as we find the purpose that you have for us but we can find the way that you intended for us. And Lord, help us to understand that you're a forgiving God and if we mess up, we shouldn't quit. We get forgiveness as we repent and then go on forward and do the best we can to serve you as long as we have breath in our lungs. Bless us to that end, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. As the music